Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Juan Cole. We'll be discussing his latest book, Engaging the Muslim World. Welcome to Rip Rap, Juan. Thanks for having me, Jim. This is a real pleasure to have you on the program uh, for a second time. Um, because your careful and thorough informed scholarship in the Middle East, known widely for its depth and breadth, has served for me and many scholars as a kind of tonic or antidote from the more simplistic notions that have muddied the waters in understanding the dynamics of what has been and is taking place in the volatile region of the world. As you point out in this book, Engaging the Muslim World, that very misinformation has evoked what you call Islam anxiety at a point where you claim the Muslim world and the West are at a standoff. I think, and, and now with the election of President Obama, you're beginning to see a recrudescence of, uh, of that uh, uh, fringe culture, uh, which is very dangerous. I and, think it's uh, like doubled or tripled yeah. since the election. Yeah, well, I think the people who are uh, now declaring for it all along had those predilections, but they're, they're coming out of the woodwork. So anyway, all I'm saying is that every culture has its, its, its far right-wing fringes. Uh, they're more important at some times than others. And uh, this attitude that, the, that Americans have started to take, that you know, the Muslim world is somehow peculiar, uh, that's really not justified. And in fact, you know, I, make, I think I make this point in the book, but between 1900 and 1950, the, the troublemakers in the world were the Europeans. I mean, they had a few, you know, sort of polish off like <laughs> 70 million people in that half, half century. I mean, it was incredible the kind of revolutions and wars and radical movements and assassinations and so forth that roiled Europe for 50 years. Uh, and uh, uh, now we think, you know, when we think of Europe, it's uh, bicycling in Rotterdam and it's all nice and so forth, but it wasn't like that earlier. And uh, I would argue that um, uh, in the same way, you know, the Middle East is going through a, a phase uh, and it, it, it has to do with a lot of wrenching social dislocations, the movement of peasants to the cities and uh, the rise in literacy and various kinds of political alienation and so forth, which were characteristic of Europe in an earlier period too. Well, you made the point in the book about how the number of Iraqi refugees is the equivalent of what the states of Michigan and California yeah, it's, and it's just an incredible amount. The, um, the UN uh, High Commission on Refugees estimates uh, that they're on the order of 2.7 million displaced Iraqis internally uh, and another million and a half externally. Uh, so altogether, you know, you're talking about 4 million people or so. This is in a country of 27 million. So uh, that's a very large proportion of the country. And I just point out, you know, if you mapped the 27 million of Iraq on our 300 million, uh, 4 million displaced people would be, you know, a whole state, a large state. Okay. Uh, and uh, so uh, we don't stop to think what we've done to I Iraq because it was our invasion that kicked off this massive displacement of people. And, you know, a million Iraqis in, in Syria uh, Increasingly, their money is running out, their kids aren't getting schooled, uh, they've got no prospects, they can't go home because militias are sitting in their, uh, in their houses and have taken control of their neighborhoods and their property. Who's going to do something for those people? Uh, and, you know, President Obama now just last week appointed two individuals uh, to a refugee committee. At least the, 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 the U.S. government is now admitting that there is a problem and that we have some responsibility for it. One of the things I thought was fascinating, as I mentioned earlier, is the closely nuanced reading of the dynamics in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran. It seems to me the news media seems to paint them all with the same brush, and they really are different countries with different complexities. Sure. Well, you know, when talks about the Muslim world or the Middle East as though that's a region, it's, it's uh, uh, it's got some commonalities and so forth, but in fact, as you say, it's extremely diverse. And a lot of people in the region don't identify themselves that way. So I'll tell you a quick joke. Uh, you know, Turkey is a NATO country, it's, it, and it wants to join the European Union. Uh, it's a Muslim-majority state, but it's, it's 
its uh, military and most of its governments have been sort of militantly secular, uh, not, don't like religion very much. Uh, and so uh, they, the Turks don't think of themselves as being in the Middle East. Uh, when they say Middle East in Turkish, they're talking about someplace else. Uh, and so the joke is that an American general came to address uh, the, the Turkish generals in Ankara, and uh, he said, well, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here in the Middle East. And, you know, the, the Turkish generals were kind of shifting in their chairs and uncomfortable, and one of them finally raised his hand and said, sir, uh, Turkey is a European country. Uh, so um, uh, the general was taken aback. He said, well, yes, that's right. Turkey is the only Middle Eastern country in Europe. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the things that I kept wondering about was Israel and the Palestinian situation, which seems to constantly have this effect on all the political interaction in that area. Uh, and, you know, it's taken a rather crazy turn since the latest person became prime minister. But it just seems that different efforts have been made toward peace. You think that, you know, something has been reached and then it literally comes apart. And yet that seems to be almost a linchpin for the region and how it functions. Yeah. Well, I, I often have Americans just flatly tell me in disbelief that they can't accept that the Palestinian issue is so important for so many people in the region. But as somebody who lived 10 years in the region, I can tell you <laughs> that it is very, very important to them. Uh, and um, I don't think it's that hard to understand. Uh, you know, um, uh, there have been lots of of situations in, in U.S. history where you might be able to make an analogy. Uh, if you go back to the uh, mid-19th century, don't you think that people in Maine and uh, New Hampshire and, and Virginia were, were pretty upset about the siege of the Alamo? Right? right. I mean, they're, they're, those were their guys, right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, Daniel Boone and others were besieged there. And it, it, it consumed our media and it, it made for passions against uh, Mexico and so forth. Well, you know, the, the Palestinians are kind of the Alamo of, uh, of the Arab world. Uh, they are uh, seen as fellow Arabs, as part of the Arab nation, uh, as an ethnicity, and they are perceived in the Arab world to have been mistreated. I mean, there's a Western narrative and, 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 and an Israeli narrative about what happened in 48 and after. Uh, but we have to understand all the narratives in the region if we can understand why people think and say what they do. And the Arab narrative is almost never heard. Uh, and from their point of view, the Palestinians were living peacefully in their country, had been for a very long time. The British showed up after, during World War I and conquered them, uh, made them a colony or a mandate, and then gave the mandate away to the Zionist movement in Europe Tens of thousands of Jews began to come and settle. Uh, and then in World War, in, in the 30s, with the rise of fascism and so forth, very large numbers of Jews escaped uh, and came to Palestine, one of the few places that they could go, uh, and ultimately displaced uh, um, several hundred thousand Palestinians from their homes. And, uh, and those refugees have now grown into several million. And they've never been offered reparations for all the property that they lost. Uh, and they, uh, many of them are still living in camps. And uh, because of the touchiness of nationality and, and ethnic balance in a lot of Arab countries, mostly they've never been offered citizenship anyplace. So they're stateless. And that's the crux of the issue. The Palestinians are one of the very few groups in the world that don't have a state. And if you think about it, if you don't have a state, you don't really have any rights. I mean, when you say you own this house, if somebody challenged you about that and said, no, they own it, how would you prove you owned it? Well, you've got a deed at the county, the courts would back you up, the police would come and take the guy away if he tried to invade your home, said it was his, and so forth. So it is the state that allows you to live peacefully in your home and to maintain that you own it. Palestinians don't have that, which means 
that they are very frequently dispossessed of their property uh, and even uh, thrown out of their country. Uh, and until they have a state, until they have citizenship in a state, they're really uh, uh, sitting ducks. And every time something is done to them by Israeli settlers uh, or the Israeli government, it's front page news in the Arab world, it's the lead item on the Arab satellite uh, television networks, and it works people's emotions up that, that here you've got a group which is manifestly being mistreated, which is stateless, which is helpless, which is being rendered homeless, in some instances even blockaded as in Gaza and deprived of enough food to eat, and the world washes its hands of them and said, well, it's not our problem, you know, too bad. Uh, or, or even just denies that it's happening. So th this creates a certain amount of anger in the region. Uh, and uh, it, the, the fact that Americans can't understand or empathize with what the Palestinians are going through uh, is the fault of our corporate media who simply, for the most part, uh, don't uh, convey to the American public what actually is going on. One question I'd like to ask my students is what they know about the wall. And they think of a wall is something like a fence. They don't understand that it's carefully gerrymandered all the parts in the West Bank and so forth. And what, after I read the Arab American News, I learned that Israelis now are stamping the passports Palestinian Authority, which has enormous implications because that means they can only go to the sections controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which is a relatively small part of that whole thing. But it's a huge entity. This isn't some little fence. This is, what, 20 or 30 feet tall. There's a road in front of it. There's, yeah. you know, uh, and, and they are absolutely shocked because they don't realize what that, what that means. Well, and it was built on the Palestinian territory, and it divides Palestinian villages. It, it's had a very bad economic impact on the city of Bethlehem. Uh, and, and so on. It's, it's taken away people's farmland. So it is an act of theft in addition to being a barrier. Um, well, uh, as I said, our, our media don't serve us well uh, in explaining these things. And I, I understand, you know, the United States has an alliance with Israel, and Israel is a friend of the United States. There's nothing wrong with, with Israel per se, but Israeli actions in the West Bank and Gaza uh, are, are wrong. Uh, they are, many of them, illegal. Uh, and uh, it's not good for the Israelis to go on doing these things, not good for their psychology, it's not good for them as a nation, and, and, and we really need uh, to, to understand that this is causing a lot of trouble for the Israelis, for the Palestinians, and for the Middle East, uh, and the trouble is not going to stop as long as, as uh, the displacement and the dispossession of the Palestinians continues. One of the questions I've got it has to do with what do we do now we we're still at war with Iraq. We're still in Afghanistan. Um, we were supposed to withdraw and haven't. And um, the longer we stay, the worse it seems to get. And if you read the news reports closely, um, on one hand, the military is saying, oh, things are working better. But if you read closely, they're really not. They really lost control of it. But in terms of this process of engagement, uh, you suggest in the book that we need to get out. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly the military occupations are just roiling the relations between the United States and the Muslim world. Uh, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any good end to, the, to a U.S. attempt to stay um, for very much longer. Uh, in fact, uh, the Bush administration itself, uh, very reluctantly, was, was pushed into a status of forces agreement with Iraq, which specified that U.S. troops, all U.S. troops, would be out uh, by the end of 2011. And this was negotiated uh, by Bush as president with the Iraqi parliament. Uh, uh, ironically enough, our Congress was not a allowed to be involved. Uh, but. Um, uh, now it, it's just come out uh, recently that the uh, uh, Prime Minister's uh, cabinet in Iraq, uh, Nouri al-Maliki's cabinet, is trying to put an item uh, uh, on a referendum in uh, January of 2010, uh, which would allow the Iraqi public, if they so desired, to move up the deadline for the withdrawal of all U.S. troops to the end of 2010. 
so um, there are certain political forces in Iraq that obviously want the U.S. out on a short time uh, uh, timetable. Uh, and um, I think the U.S. will get out of Iraq in the foreseeable future. Uh, I think there will still be a U.S.-Iraqi military cooperation of various sorts. The U.S., in a way, is going to have to provide Iraq's air force probably for a decade or so. Uh, but um, I think bases are not going to be there. And uh, I, it's very clear that it's not what the Iraqi government wants. It's, pro it's certainly not what the Iraqi people want, is to continue to have U.S. troops there. And, you know, the U.S. troops withdrew from uh, the, the cities in, um, at the end of June of 2009. And uh, the subsequent month saw a dramatic drop uh, by a third uh, in uh, attacks and in deaths. So take the, the U.S. troops out of the cities, don't have them patrol, and the violence is less. Uh, the only place that didn't happen was the northern city of Mosul, which, which still has an insurgency going on. But on the whole, in most of the country, uh, Iraq's violence fell when the U.S. withdrew from the cities. So uh, I, uh, I think some of the violence was very clearly being generated by the patrols themselves. People were attacking the patrols uh, with roadside bombs and killing Iraqis as, as well as sometimes Americans. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the Iraqi military... Uh, has its faults, but uh, the new Iraqi military that has grown up, uh, been trained and equipped in the past uh, six years, uh, is beginning to be able to patrol independently, to put down militia revolts, uh, and to provide basic security in much of the country. Not everywhere, maybe, but in much of the country. Uh, and so that's all along been uh, the, the, uh, the foundation of any U.S. withdrawal, is that there be you know, somebody who could supply order. Uh, and so I think we're increasingly getting to the point where Iraq is not a paradise. Uh, it's a very dangerous place. There's still lots of ethnic divisions. There's violence. But it's getting to the point where the U.S. being there is not helping things. What about Afghanistan? Yeah, well, I have a chapter in the book on Afghanistan and Pakistan as well. Uh, Afghanistan is a more difficult project. Uh, if, if, if what you want is to stand up a government and an army uh, that could as I say, supply order and then leave. Uh, doing that for Afghanistan is a tall order. Afghanistan is a country of 34 million, which has been at war virtually ever since 1979. Uh, and I mean war, I mean massive war, uh, destruction of entire cities, displacement of uh, millions and millions of people. In fact, the displacements in Afghanistan have been worse than than the ones in Iraq, proportionally. Uh, at a time in the 80s when Afghanistan's population was probably on the order of 16 or 17 million, there were 5 million Afghans uh, displaced, uh, to, uh, 3 million to Pakistan, 2 million to Iran. Uh, and so um, uh, it's the world's fifth poorest country. Uh, its infrastructure has been didn't never amount to much to begin with, but it's been battered, roads no good, uh, and uh, uh, bridges out and tunnels down. And uh, I mean, you would it would take an investment of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to get the place back on its feet. And then there's severe ethnic and religious uh, conflict. Ten percent of the country is controlled by the Taliban or by other anti-government uh, forces of a fundamentalist sort. Uh, and the government, uh, the Kabul government, only controls 30 uh, percent. So uh, General McChrystal, who's just taken over, is hoping that uh, he can train an Afghan army, uh, as was done in Iraq, uh, that ultimately would be able to supply uh, order. And that in the meantime, he can US, use NATO and US troops to tamp down the violence and to take provinces like Helmand back away from uh, the Taliban. Uh, but, um, um, you know, it, it's, it, the difficulty of the task is demonstrated by just the statistics. If, if you had an army of, say, 200,000, the kind that's being envisaged for Afghanistan, uh, it would probably cost a couple billion dollars a year to keep it going equipment and training and, and 
salaries and so forth. Uh, Afghanistan's government budget is a little over a billion. <laughs> the whole gross domestic product is something like nine billion. About a third of that, about three billion, is coming from uh, drug sales from poppies made into heroin, uh, which is probably not helping the government very much, let us say. So uh, who's going to pay for this army? Uh, how is it going to maintain itself? And, I mean, you're, you're looking at a, a basket case, which probably is going to be on the international dole for a long time. And it may well be that the United States is going to have to just dedicate $2 billion a year uh, to pay the Afghan army. And of course, then there are all these problems of graft. Does the money really go to the army, or does it go into somebody's pockets, and so forth? So um, I'm not optimistic about uh, Afghanistan ending well. Uh, I think it's a different case than Iraq, which uh, it, it is a very difficult case in itself, but at least Iraq does have substantial petroleum receipts and therefore resources with which an Iraqi government could do something. Well, and then there's that area between Pakistan and Afghanistan, the mountainous area that, who knows? <laughs> I mean, that is such uh, a difficult area to do anything in. Yeah, it's a mountainous region, it's uh, craggy, it's rugged, uh, it's arid. And uh, it's highland, uh, a lot of it. The, uh, the, it belongs to the Pakistani government. The Pakistani government says that 30% of the uh, federally administrated tribal areas, what they call Fatah, uh, is inaccessible. 30% of this territory is inaccessible to the Pakistani government, <laughs> which supposedly you know, rules it. So um, the idea of controlling it uh, is, is a non-starter, I think. And uh, for a very long time, the only way you get anything done in that region is to make alliances with tribal leaders and get them on your side, bribe them, do things for them, make coalitions, and so forth. And um, uh, sort of direct military action against them has usually backfired. And it backfired for the British, who fought many engagements uh, in that area and never really were able to establish order. Well, thank you for appearing on RIPRAP. Your scholarship really is pretty difficult. I mean, it, um, because of the bias of the media, because of the bias of a lot of people who should know better, you know, um, it's difficult to understand what's really going on. And I think your book and your other books have provided a fairly closely nuanced look at something that's being painted with a, a broad brush. So thank you for appearing on Rip Rat. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Jim. Hello, I'm Jim Schaefer, the host and executive producer of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. And what I'd like to do right now is to share with you how our unique and historic television series can use academic research to bring exciting, vital insights into important topics 
that affect our everyday lives. What kinds of topics? The politics and other dynamics that produce the gasoline from foreign countries for gasoline in the cars we drive. The way we care for ourselves and our family. Our sense of fashion. The ways we are attracted to other people. The media we use. And the ways that the media use us. And shape our lives and what we think about. And even what we remember and dream about. Plus, the quality of food we eat. The music we listen to. So, who are we? First, let me explain our name. We quickly decided that we needed a one-word title, like many of the popular television programs that were being broadcast as we started up. Like The Tonight Show, The Today Show, and the famous Bonanza Show. We liked the word riprap, both for what it is and what it is not. Our program is definitely not a rip, as in some kind of vicious attack. Nor a rap, meaning some sort of extended monologue, sometimes set to music. Instead, we wanted to concentrate on the word rip-rap itself, in the way the poet Gary Snyder uses the concept of rip-rap in his work, as a construction of words deliberately set before the mind in space and time. And over the years, we've discovered that a wide range of people, including scholars and serious readers in the wider community, enjoy the topics we discuss. So we see our program as encouraging people to explore academic research because it's based on solid work. And over the years, we've discovered that a wide range of people, including scholars and serious readers in the wider community, enjoy the topics we discuss, such as bioethics and what to do with the fertilized embryos when the parents no longer want them and the heart-wrenching struggles of people who try to use reproductive technologies to offset infertility, and the AIDS epidemic and its shattering impact that it's had on the lives of millions of people around the world, the nursing shortage, and how wonder drugs like Prozac affect the ways that we shape the narratives of our lives and the questions that science raises about issues like global warming and even the sports we watch and play. So that's a part of the Rip Rap story. We're creating history as we bring serious academic research into the public discourse. 